So if we met on the street, looking as I do, you'd never know that I have jumped out of a perfectly good moving aircraft with 60 pounds of gear strapped to my legs. You'd never know that I've repelled out of helicopters, that I've ridden on armored vehicles across the plains of Eastern Europe. I've invaded a country. I've returned fire at 11,000 feet above sea level. I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan. I have led everything from small teams to a platoon. I am fourth generation United States Army. It has been my profession, my vocation. It has provided for me and mine, and I regret none of it. So as a veteran, I'm here tonight to talk to you about veterans. So who are veterans? Well, the larger venture community will accept anybody who has served or is serving in the United States military. But legally, under 38 U.S. Code 101, the government defines a veteran as a person who served in the active military, naval or air service, and who has discharged or released therefrom under conditions other than dishonorable. Now, how many veterans are there? Well, according to the U.S. Census 2020, there's about 18 million veterans right now, 7% of the U.S. population. 9% are female, and that's growing every year. That number grows. The largest group of veterans by conflict are Vietnam veterans, like my father. 77% are white, 12% are African American, 7% are Hispanic, 7% are Hispanic and 2% are Asian American. 27.7% of us hold a bachelor's degree or higher. 1.3 active duty personnel at this time, which is a little bit less than 1% of the population. So that's who we are legally, and that's who we are statistically. But who are we culturally? Well, the first group is probably the largest group. It's the quiet ones. And then you have the opposite, which is the next group. They're loud and proud. They wear t-shirts, sport bumper stickers. They bring it up in class. They write about it in reflective essays. Then you have the next group, the career types like me. Do you know you can join the military at 18 and retire from it at 38? Now you have to re-enter the civilian workforce looking for purpose and direction. And the best place to find that is in the educational environment, in the classroom. That's why when occasionally you walk into an undergrad class and there's a 38-year-old sitting there like somebody just brought their parent to Econ 101. The next type are the one and done. They did an initial contract, served their country, earned their benefits, and now they're home. And then there's the last group. They kind of mix into all of them. And that is the combat veteran. Combat is not required to be a veteran. Some people never go into harm's way. Some of us do. I did three tours in Iraq and one in Afghanistan. I didn't see combat every day, but I did see combat. And in those moments, I had to make decisions I knew had dramatic second and third order effects. I did everything in my power to make sure my soldiers were taken care of. Over the course of my career and my deployments, I lost friends and I miss them so very much. I'm haunted by some of my experiences, but at times, I miss it. I miss the rush. I miss the chaos. I miss the bonds formed with those soldiers under fire. And I bring all of those experiences to the classroom when I teach and when I am the student. Where are veterans? Well, technically everywhere, but for the purpose of this TED Talk, they're in the halls of the higher education. So like LB, L, LGBTQ+, minority, first generation college students, veteran students are coming to the classroom. And with them, they are bringing their strengths and they're bringing their specific challenges. Their challenges have to be identified and addressed, but their strengths need to be reinforced and uplifted and accepted. So anybody who has spent any time in front of a classroom instructing understands there's the difference between pedagogy, which is the teaching of adolescents and children, and andragogy, which is the teaching of adults. Now, adolescents, or rather late adolescents, is usually 18 to 24 years old. And 
That's the average age of the American undergrad college student. But when you join the military, regardless of age, from day one, you are taught as an adult. You are taught that everything has a purpose, and if it doesn't have a purpose, it is not important. You are taught that you go to a course or additional training because it serves your unit or it serves your progression. It really kind of makes sense when you think about it though, between training, preparing, certifying, and occasionally sleeping, there isn't a lot of time left at the end of the day. So, as we approach the veteran student in the classroom, would andragogy work better than pedagogy? It might work. It hasn't been done on a large scale. So, let's take a speculative look at Malcolm Knowles' six assumptions of andragogy through the lens of a veteran. So the first one is self-concept. From day one in the military, we are taught accountability. Accountability to self, accountability to unit, accountability to the military. We own our successes and failures, and when you're a leader in the military, you own the successes, successes and failures of your soldiers and your organization. It instills with you a sense of purpose and responsibility. The next one is experience. We start with building blocks, small tasks that lead into bigger tasks. You, we call this training progression. You qualify with an individual weapon, and by the end of the year, you are doing brigade-level operations involving thousands of soldiers, helicopters, tanks, and then you start it all over again the next year. Four years of that, and you understand how to use building box to attain an educational goal. 20 years of that, you're taking apart weapons in the dark in a moving vehicle. The next one is readiness. I like to call it the rucksack model. If you don't need it, you don't bring it with you. It's really hard for veteran students sometimes to understand why certain core classes are important. Let's take philosophy. Right? For veteran students, they're like, why is this important? Well, it's important to see different diverse views and to see how reality can be shaped. This is going to help you become a problem solver, a critical thinker. Philosophy is important. We just have to make it understandable for the veteran student to own that. The next is orientation. There is no unrealistic training in the military. Everything is based on reality. Even the forces that we fight against at the major training centers are based on actual potential adversaries. How will this help me learn how to blank is a very important question for a veteran. It has to be realistic. It can't be theoretical. The next is motivation. Veteran students want, have educational goals. They want to get after them because they want to achieve those and move on. They hate busy work. They also really hate because I said so with no explanation afterwards. They thrive on understanding the concepts and the deeper meanings behind things, but they don't want to spend a lot of time spinning their wheels. They need to understand that that annotated bibliography at the beginning of the semester is going to help them with that final paper at the end of the semester. And the next thing is need to know. Now it is absolutely wonderful knowing who is in the mouth of Satan in Dante's Inferno, but I could have done my job in the military without ever knowing that. We need to know why this is important, and then we need to know we can use it. And that's very important for veterans. Now we've talked background, we've talked to education. Here's the last part, emotional development. We take young people and we teach them very complex and sometimes very scary things in the military. But we also teach them resilience. We teach them how to find resilience in yourself, but more importantly, how to find it within the unit, within your organization. And that's where a lot of veterans struggle when they leave the military, when they come to college, that loss of team. I am 43 years old. I still talk to those guys in the picture on a regular basis, and I bounce things, including this TED Talk, off of them. But we miss that when we leave the military. We search for that purpose. So what do we do 
as higher ed members of the higher education community to make them more comfortable and feel better about being away from that team. Well, on an institutional level, learning living communities and veteran programs are outstanding place to start. Bringing veterans from across different majors at different points in their collegiate career, bringing them together to support each other and to mentor each other is great. Just knowing that the person next to me has experienced something like I have experienced is comforting. We don't ever have to talk about our experiences in, in detail for it to be strengthening. The other thing is, is we need to talk to our veterans one-on-one, -on -one, from professors to advisors to staff. We need to learn who they are. A lot of veterans view their service in a positive way. It's something that built them, that strengthened them. They view it as a good thing. You may not. Well, everybody is entitled to their opinion. But think about what happens when you don't try to reach a center point with that student. I had a veteran student tell me once their freshman advisor said, I'm really sorry you had to do that to pay for college. That was heartbreaking for that student. We need to reach out to these students and we need to meet them halfway and uh, learn from each other. So the American veteran student understands that education is critical and that college is a good way to become successful in American society and culture. Jobs that did not require a degree 60 years ago today require a degree. So we need to meet them halfway. We need to understand where they're coming from. We need to explain where we're coming from as higher education. Let's learn together. Thank you.